Like you're tuning into Quality Violence Cinema, I'm Christian. I'm Gabla. And today we're sitting with uh, Mario Cerrito, director of the Human Hibachi franchise. Uh, well, soon to be franchise, right? This is kind of a two part right now, but yeah, it's like a two, yeah. So appreciate your time. Me, Basically, just kind of wanted to welcome you to the show, and also if you just kind of want to give a rundown of like your history, where you're from, and kind of what got you started. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, guys, thanks for having me. Always cool seeing guys support independent film. Uh, I think there should be more of it out there because I feel like independent film is the uh, heart and soul of film yeah i'm from philly originally i was born in south philadelphia uh, i live in south jersey which is i'm like 12 minutes away from philly over here i never wanted to get into film i was always a baseball player an athlete uh through high school played in the college uh and then once college baseball stopped i kind of lost like a passion for anything in life you know what i mean i kind of mm -hmm. just i lost my purpose so i wrote a couple screenplays had no clue what to do with them now I'm talking about screenplays that are, you know, uh, million dollar budgets, uh, things that, you know, feasi feasibly when you when you don't have any money, you're not going to be able to get them made. So they're just paper. So my wife found them when I first met her. She read them. She's like, you should try and get these made. I was like, I don't know how to get these made. I was like, I don't know anybody in the film business. So, you know, I started branching out on Facebook, you know, connecting with people. And uh, back in 2012, I did my first trailer for like a film called uh, The Cornfield Massacre. We tried getting, uh, you know, that funded for the trailer and we never got the money for that. So then I was like, oh man, you know, how do I, how do I start? So I did a film in 2013 on $10,000 called Deadly Gamble, and that was when I got my start, so basically. Oh, yeah, so, and um, there was kind of a small section in there, just because, like I said, before this, I was doing some research, but you, yeah, would, sure. build, you would build haunts in your uh, parents' backyard? Yeah, dude, that's cool you brought that up, man. So uh, I might have been eight or nine, and around Halloween time, uh, I would start, when we had, like, a decent-sized backyard, I would uh, start making, like, uh, haunted attractions in the backyard which i never knew why i did that you know what i mean yeah i would invite like the neighborhood kids and the you know kids from across the street i would tell them to come walk through it and kind of entertaining them at a young age uh with the horror stuff so that's kind of how i mean honestly i guess that would be my start where you know i started entertaining but i really didn't know it then until now it all makes sense yeah is that where you like kind of learned your earliest special effects and bringing that into your work yeah right exactly yeah. which is pretty cool to think about, you know, but uh, it's crazy because I do believe that like, you know, we all have like our certain things and, you know, they might start at a young age, but you don't realize it until you're you're older. So you built haunts when you were, you said eight or nine, you're building haunts, but that had to be inspired from somewhere. So like, what was your first like earliest memory with horror and like the uh, that have affected you? So I want to say when I was around that age, around that time frame. Uh, there was the uh, the firehouse in town always around Halloween time always had the firefighters put on like a uh, haunted uh, house basically so all the town's kids would go there and I thought I was so enthralled by that like that whole um, you know like the the haunts and I think that's definitely where I caught the bug of horror because I am I love horror like just anything to do with horror so that's kind of where it all started I think personally so what were your films before the human hibachi because there's a couple yeah so uh 2013 I did deadly gamble which is like a uh it's a thriller slash horror it's more so so now that's more like your cinematic type film where I had a camera crew went through like the local uh film school called Temple University here in Philly I basically all the kids that graduated I uh I put out like a cast uh, crew call for like camera guys lighting guys audio guys and I assembled a crew you know, and we shot that cinematically. That was 2013. That got like worldwide distribution. It was on cable TV, you know, all kinds of like platforms. Uh, I think it went to Amazon Prime, all the all the platforms streaming. Then 2015, I did another thriller horror called The Listing. And that went to, uh, actually went to like Cannes Film Festival. It's uh, called Marche du Film. It's, uh, it's a big event over, it's happening right now at Cannes. So uh, I was doing some like normal mainstream, I'm going to say type stuff. But then that led to Human Hibachi because I was like, I call them cookie cutter films, kind of like where they blend in, like where you're not really going to get any kind of small following. You're just going to blend into all the other VOD films that are out there. And that's what led to Human Hibachi. I was like, I got to do something a little like catchy or crazy or something that's just going to be like different from what everybody else is kind of doing on the mainstream level. So that's kind of what brought me down this foxhole. So what led you to meeting uh, Frank Volopi and uh, yeah. him acting for you? Yeah, so Frank, uh, I was directing a film that I was hired to direct in Philly. And he was actually just like an extra on the film set. It was a restaurant scene. And he came up to me and he was like, you know, introduced himself. He's a go-getter. And he was just like, hey, man. He's like, you know, I'm a local actor here in Philly. So we connected. And then when I put out the casting call for uh, Human Hibachi 2, he hit me up on uh, Facebook. We got to talking. I sent him the script. And I said, listen, give me some stuff. Show me something. So he sent back uh, 
I think like a video or something. And I was like, yeah, dude, this guy's got it. And he was a, he was a pretty good actor. So, and he's got a lot of drive. So yeah, he's phenomenal actor. Is that the only person that went to acting school that you used or was there other people that were trained? No, I used a ton. The guy that I did both my first films with his name Bernard Gunkowski. He owns a Philadelphia acting studio, but he was mm -hmm. like the main actor in both my movies. So I kind of go for him, say like, I need to fill a certain role, like an Asian person or, I'll just hit him up and give him the description and then he'll send me people. So uh, I do use a lot of people for his school. And then, uh, you know, just in general, it's kind of like a tree branch thing. The more people you start, you know, you know, meeting, you could ask somebody for uh, an actor and they'll send them to you and you just audition them. So, mm -hmm. You just kind of yeah. hope it works out sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you got to wing it too, man. That, that's the other thing, right? Yeah. Sometimes you got to have faith. They're like, ah, I will try it out. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. so probably since you brought it up but human hibachi too good segue into the series but uh sure. I know the first movie was entirely shot on iphone was the second one as well or did you actually yeah. use iphones and then also have like a more professional camera Nah, they were both completely on iphone um the first <laughs> one had actually more non-iphone i would say than the second one was really just on the iphone uh the first one had you'll see some like surveillance shots that i use mm -hmm. you know what i mean so we incorporated yeah. those that was like gopro we would just like set a GoPro up and get those surveillance shots. Uh, the second one, let me just rewind my mind. I, I want to say that was completely 100% iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. That was funny. There was sometimes there was an iPhone shooting on an iPhone while they're recording people on an iPhone. It was just like, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. they got so many phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's actually that's actually really cool because during the first one, like the surveillance scene towards the beginning of the movie when she hides right. behind, like trying to climb the fence, we were, when we watched it, we were actually talking. We we're like, Did, does he have a buddy who owns a place and is like letting him use the surveillance camera or something? But you actually just right. set that up and shot it yourself. You know, it's, you know, what's funny is that place, I don't even want to, I don't even think they had some, like working surveillance in there. Um, I was friends with the owner, so I had to run of the place. Like, after they shut down uh, after hours, like, uh, they let us come in and film. But, no, they didn't have, like, where I needed the surveillance. I actually had to set up, like, a ladder, get up there, and, like, actually, you know what I mean? Kind of, like, kind of uh, put, like, a dummy camera there and make it run. So, yeah, that's kind of I mean, what the shit you got to do, man, when you do out. this. Yeah, absolutely. But, so, how long did shooting take for each film? Uh, the first one, I want to say the first one. So, the days, I'm going to say that was like seven or eight days uh, over a course of probably two months. Because what happens is that's the hardest part of independent filmmaking is making the schedule work for everybody. You know what I mean? So you might get like where three days out of June match up for everybody, but then everybody doesn't match back up till July. So so it kind of spreads out. But I think I'm going to say it was like seven days. Uh, and then the second one, about the same is like seven days. So. But uh, over a course of like two months each, both of them. So where'd you get the gore props from? The first film, there's this place uh, I use out of Cali, California. Uh, they actually make really good stuff. It's called Cat Dapper Cadaver. They're they're like they do all like Hollywood's um, you know stuff like that, like body parts and all that. So I I, I get them off there, and then some of them are self made, like stuff like uh, you know like if you're doing like like cutting like a throat. My wife is actually really good at that stuff, so I it's really nice having her in the house. Cause I can kind of relay to her what I, what I'm looking for. You know what I mean? But yeah, other than that, I mean, dapper cadaver, man, they're, they're super solid. And uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a, especially the, there was a corpse that was in the fridge and yeah, I that thought was cool. just, that one thing was like super realistic. I thought that was really good. Yeah. That but, thing's cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, kind of like your films because of, I think some of that gore, like I was saying before, it reminds me of a lot of those like necro, like low budget necro films right. that are, right. I think that's really cool. So, but yeah. with actual like acting and, better exactly um, better effects because some of those are just so bad they're like special effects like shooter and they they put like a little bit of blood right there and then right right and she's right. dead and like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. could do a little better than that come on it's right, just like right. such the smallest little like you see the tip of the spray around the corner it's like nah it's like you know what it was is like because i knew going into it i was like all right so the budget's nothing i mean there's no budget when you do this stuff like when you uh you know when you're doing it yourself i mean you still got bills to pay. So, I mean, there's no budget, but I knew in order for it to work, you got to put all the money into the effects. So like the, like that torso that was hanging in the fridge, that's an expensive item. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that I knew expensive. if I shot it found footage style, then I don't have to pay a camera guy who's super expensive. So now all the budget's going to go into the stuff that, you know, the shock factor or the, the effects gonna. So that's kind of why, you know, I, I went that route found footage because if I hadn't, then, 
I never been able to make them because you know the camera crew and all that. I mean, they're you're talking. 50, 60, 80,000, which is just, we don't have, so. And is that where it kind of goes back into shooting on the iPhone was like a budgetary 100%. thing? Yeah. yeah, 100%. Yeah, and that's why I incorporated the whole, you know, the storyline behind it where it could work that way because mm-hmm. now it makes sense to why it shot on the iPhone. So it kind yeah. of was like the perfect storm that way where I could do it and, you know, still have it be somewhat effective. Did you try to do a GoFundMe or any kind of? I've done them. Uh, they don't really work unless you kind of have like a, uh, you got to have somebody that knows what the hell they're doing with that. Like, you know, I mean, if you go and start those, you might get a couple thousand, but I mean, in order for, you know, you, have, you see some of these with people are making 150 grand, they, they hire somebody mm-hmm. that knows what they're, you know what I mean? They got to go viral. Like the thing's got to go viral for it to really, you know, pick up a, uh, a big, big number on that. But I've tried them. I've only gotten like, I think the most I got was like 1500 or 1800, which is just enough for like insurance for your film. You know what I mean? So, Mm-hmm. you know it's it's, it's not a help so- somewhere but yeah but i, I get yeah, that it's exactly. not gonna it's not gonna take uh take care of your whole film nah, it's nah, enough nah. to help no exactly yeah especially if you're just starting out 100 percent. so what about the meat um so there because there's times that they actually are consuming part of the meat what was that made right. out of i mean besides uh, the like i'm talking about the, the meat, intestines uh, contestant scene so that was um in the first one you're saying when they got when the, well, the, girl the second out. one too they had yeah, the second yeah, one they have right. an intestine eating into i want to say so my fx girl i actually had an fx girl named gidget on some of the stuff too she made i forget how she made it. i told her what i needed i was like listen i needed to need it to look like they're eating intestines i don't know what she did i know it was some kind of casing like meat casing um sausage casings and then she filled them with uh i don't know what she filled them with but maybe like candy or something but it was actually like a casing of a sausage hmm. and then we just filled it up. And then I told the actors, it's probably gonna be super gross and, <laughs> you know, just do your best with it. And, uh, you know, they ate it. So, but yeah, that was, uh, that was real stuff. That was edible. No, yeah, that was really good. We were, when we were watching, we were like trying to guess. And I said, right. in, in the center. yeah, yeah, I yeah. I, I almost, I, I want to say it was casings of like sausage and then some kind of candy or something she put in there, but I yeah. wouldn't eat it. I, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that uh i noticed between Hiba- human hibachi one and human hibachi two is that human hibachi one had a lot more settings in it whereas right. the story of the second one with it being the backwoods family uh right. was more a single kind of single location where it's just on this farm in these backwoods was there any specific reason for the changes between like the rich guy cult sort of thing into the uh backwoods like family inspired uh, by it? so i'm a big fan of any kind of like I mean, wood setting, man. Like, I just feel like it's like a, it's a built in kind of fear factor. I mean, you're in the woods, so you know, at night you can, here's the thing, like when you're looking for locations, that's the other part of independent, independent filmmaking, looking for locations and actually getting the freedom to use them is near impossible. Not near impossible. It's hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause you got to go to somebody that's got, now got to let you in half the time you're using a place for free. So you're not even paying them. You know what I mean? So you're being a burden on these locations. Um, so I knew a guy that had a house in the woods for the second one. And he was like, yeah, man, he was so cool. He's like, you can have the run of the place. So that's kind of how that happened. Now I'm thinking now I got to make a script around that location I have. So it was kind of like location first yeah. and then, you know, write the script to fit it. So that's kind of how it came about with mm-hmm. uh, the second one. The first one, I mean, I did these two or three years apart. So like you get burned out, man. Like when you do this, like, you know, cause it might look like it, it's easy, but like when you're doing it, it's it's a lot of stress. You're dealing with actors, locations, money, all kinds of stuff. So I kind of wanted to make it easier on myself for the second one. And that's that's like the whole one location thing, you know, because yeah, it was a lot less stress to do it that way. Yeah, you're outside. And those, you know, it worked out that way. And it's probably a lot easier explaining to your buddy how to get the blood stains out other than a business that you're running man. out for the night. Yeah, you can go <laughs> like, crazy. I'm sorry, we tried. But... Exactly. I, I did read a couple of uh, reviews I thought was kind of funny. There, there was some that were like cooks, and they were talking about, he's fucking up the grill. <laughs> and they're just yeah. saying that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> I, you know, what's funny is uh, when I was using that restaurant, um, when we left, like after we did that feast, in the back of the restaurant there i didn't sleep that whole night because i'm like dude i hope that guy turned the uh, stove off and i i was so <laughs> tired i was like this place is going to be burned down and i'm just going to lose like everything i got so it's like it's a lot of stress that way you know because you're like your mind's just like running the whole time and yeah. but yeah so doing it out in the woods was awesome to be honest with you i loved it yeah 
And so with, with the change in setting and all that, and also, I mean, you just said you love the wood setting, but is, are you going to continue kind of with that? Like, isn't there a planned prequel? Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, funny like, you brought that up. I'm, uh, I'm doing a short right now. I'm going to be shooting at June 11th. Um, and it's basically going to be like a 10 minute short, maybe 15 of, and I got some authentic shots out of Japan where the guy's from Jin, the main character, the Japanese mm -hmm. guy. So it's yeah. going to be a prequel. It's going to be a prequel showing, um, how he got his start 10 to 15 minutes in Japan. And the scene is super cool. It's like a, it's a bamboo torture scene. So I got, um, I got this uh, garden, bamboo garden. We're going to be shooting in June. It's going to be like a 10 minute short. It's going to be uh, Japanese spoken, all Japanese language with uh, English, English subtitles. So I'm pretty hmm. excited for this. So what was the most difficult shot in making both films? So for the second one, right off the bat, that I know for a fact, I mean, that chainsaw scene was pretty hard. So that, um, that was shot in POV that, which, um, like, so the camera's looking out at the chainsaw guy coming in. That was pretty tough. Cause I was actually the chainsaw coming in. So yeah, I, I, I was in the credits. I was, I was like, Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was the chainsaw guy coming in. So the only reason I was the chainsaw guy is because I was using a live chainsaw. I didn't do anything like, you know what I mean? So I didn't want, I didn't trust anybody else to not, kill somebody you know what i'm saying because yeah. like, yeah, i had the chip ball running control. yeah and my wife is holding the iphone so i'm like listen if i'm if somebody's gonna kill her it's gonna be me i don't know about you know what i mean I, so i i made sure i held the chainsaw because i knew i wasn't gonna you know screw up that was a tough shot because um we had to have the phone there in a tight spot with the um you know the blood and all that so that was tough and it was dangerous so that was the most you know when you're talking tough, that was the most dangerous. Um, the first one, uh, I don't think there was anything real hard. It was all kind of straightforward. Not nothing really challenged me in that in that sense. But the second one, again, like uh, that chainsaw scene, and I think there was another one. The kidnapping scene was kind of tough too because uh, the way we had to do it, where I had the I was the camera the whole time, so I'm doing everything directing and. So mm -hmm. the way we came out of the car and it was just, that was tough too. So there was a couple more challenging shots in the second one. And with that kidnapping scene, were you able to shut down the road at all? Or were you just praying someone to no. drive by and like, uh, it's so, grabbing this girl? Yeah, it's, dude, it's all guerrilla style filmmaking. So yeah. it's like, basically, basically like we were at one location. Well, we are at a location before we shot that. And we're like, hey, let's go find a road that kind of looks cool. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of had an idea where there would be a road that might not have cars come by. It's funny you brought that up. So I had one of my production assistants down one end and another one down the other end. And I'm like, listen, if cars come, just, you know, stop them and just let them know we're filming. It looked like it could have been the deadest road in America, but there were so many cars coming down it. It's like, I was <laughs> like, is this real life? You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like one of those things. I was like, uh, yeah, it was like in the middle of the woods and all these cars kept coming down. Like, what are you guys doing? So that was that was a pain in the ass. That's what made that sh uh, shoot hard as well. It's like we're a bunch of redneck dudes and we're kidnapping this black jogger. Exactly. Lady. You're like, whoa, guys. Like, yeah, what are yeah. You out here? Like, <laughs> no, no, no. It's for a movie. Yeah, sure. What, yeah, what kind exactly. of movie? Found that's footage. Uh, that's what they say. Right. So they don't believe you. It's like what? Because she's, you know, people are screaming. It's like, oh man, it's crazy. Like the shit you do, man. Like you're like, I don't really need to be doing this shit, but then you're doing it. It's like, you know, what's wrong with me? Because it's a lot. You go through a lot of shit. You're like, so this what, seemed a lot cooler on paper. <laughs> exactly, dude. So what would you have done differently with both the movies? But number one, what would I have done differently? I would have had permits everywhere I shot so that you don't have to deal with, I mean, all the stress of, you know, being a gorilla type filmmaker, like where you're going out and just, you know, hoping you can do something or hoping something doesn't go wrong. Um, but then to get all that stuff, you got to have, you know, a big budget. Um, the first film had... Um, Here's the thing, though. So it's tough. Like the first film had some sound issues in the uh, restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, but again, would I have loved to go back and shoot it again? Yeah. But, you know, it's tough because, you know, some of the guys are from one guy was from Chicago. One guy was from uh, Colorado. So once you shoot it, that's it. So if I had mm -hmm. millions of dollars, then you can kind of really plan everything perfectly. But, you know, you're doing it this way. It's like you kind of live with what you got, you know. Yeah. So they make it work. So the only reason it works is because it is found footage. So you can just say, oh, well, it's shitty. The audio sucks. It's something wherever they were, the audio sucks. So, but yeah. And with found footage, it's hard to do voiceovering because then it just sounds uh, really yeah, off yeah. because it's not oh, found yeah. footage then. Exactly. Yeah. So you kind of just set... have a slight echo and then the other person's perfectly clear. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny you brought that up. So in the first one, I didn't have like a, a sound engineer 
in post production. I just said fuck it. I was just like let them uh, let it go. And then the second one, if you listen to the audio, it's really good. And that's because I brought in a guy that is like a professional uh, sound editor in post. He's a uh, a music uh, composer and he does all kinds of stuff. So that's the one thing I made sure I did differently in the second one was get really good audio throughout it. That's what I hear from a lot of directors that they they wish that they hired a better sound guy just to kind of like something to kind of like because it's so key it can like make and break make uh, a break it really does you know what I always say about sound is um nobody gives a shit until it's bad yeah nobody like you know I'm saying nobody says oh the sounds great like when they're in a movie when the sounds great you're not gonna say the sounds great you're just gonna watch the movie but when the sounds bad you're gonna be like dude the sounds sound Yeah. The first thing people know <laughs> it's like know. a good server versus a bad server. It's like you know, like... 100%. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, I'd have to agree that if if these movies were bigger budgeted, I don't think they would be as you know known as they are, or as highly right. regarded as they are. If they had, if they were pretty looking pseudo snuff movies, hundred percent. Honestly, yeah. like what kind? Con- I mean, and again, they did. They got like a little following. I mean, they've sold in Ch- Japan, China. Australia. I mean, none of my other movies did that. You know what I mean? And they were they were done well, like perfectly, like everything. But it's the rawness, the grittiness of like not really giving a fuck yeah. is what kind of gives it a charm. And yeah, I kind of sold knew that at Walmart, in. right? Because it was sold at good different distribution companies like Walmart. It kind of got yeah, a bigger yeah. distribution. Yeah, the first one got a bigger release. So I'm still. Uh, I mean, they were both picked up by Troma, which was always a dream because I grew up loving the Toxic Avenger and all that. The first one was picked up by a second distributor called Invincible Entertainment. They put it like wide, like where it went to Walmart, uh, Amazon, iTunes, Google Play. It was like all in the. Now the second one, uh, I didn't go back with Invincible. I'm looking for a different guy different distributor so i'm still in the process of getting like a wide wide scale release and was there some issue with the the amazon rating or something that uh happened yeah so the first time i actually went to like put it on they kicked it back and they were saying it was too extreme basically for it so i didn't do it again i was i i'm not really good with the tech side of stuff so i would have had to like do all kinds of stuff to try and get it where they accepted it the distributor I don't know what they did, but they got it on there. So now it's on there. They they kicked it back when I tried to like self distribute it on Amazon. Yeah, and they said it was too extreme. So I was like, all right, whatever. I mean, there's uh, there's ex- films that more extreme <laughs> than mine on there. I was so. gonna say like that's kind of funny because the first time I ever saw another trauma release, but uh, junk bucket, yeah. junk bucket too. Like that's about cutting dicks off and stuff. And I saw that on Amazon. Prime, I know that's you know? what I'm saying. And dude. you're yeah. getting trouble with <laughs> it. I was like, dude, my girl, my my wife watches uh, movies like on Netflix where the guys like dick is completely out like it's nothing yeah i'm yeah. like that's more extreme what the what do you, you know what i mean that'll be like pg-13 <laughs> like, exactly so yeah. is there uh something about human about you too being on sleazebox are you going through sleazebox with them or yeah so i did like a little small release with them too uh sleazebox i think that dropped like two weeks ago uh he's a good dude um he was going to pick the first one up but i think what happened was he had his own um streaming channel before and it got shut down and then that's when I was like, all right, well, so I took it back from him in the first, from the first one. And I was like, listen, if I make a sequel, I'll definitely, you know, give it back to you to put that on. So, so yeah, he put that on uh, about two weeks ago. Cool dude. Oh yeah. Yeah. We love this yeah. box stuff. Like yeah, we yeah. covered uh, chaos AD before and I'm right. like, Holocaust is one of the first ones I saw of theirs. And I was like, I love this shit. So yeah. yeah box cool. is great. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. It's a uh, trauma box, And now I'm looking for like a wide, wide release, but it's tough with these kind of movies because a lot of these distributors are like soft, you know what I'm saying? Like they'll say they're horror, but they don't get into the more extreme side. Yeah. So they kind of like, yeah, if you send them like anything that's like semi-extreme, they kind of just say it's not for them. So yeah, that, that's it's what like makes it tougher with the mainstream or anything like that. You know, nah, nah. Which story. honestly, dude, here's the thing. Like I kind of like it that way though, because again, when you're doing those regular like horror, they're, co- they're cookie, co- everybody's doing that same kind of that yeah. mold of horror film, mm-hmm. but they all, so I kind of like the, the extreme side of things. Oh yeah, that's that's what we cater towards. I mean, basically, just try to bring that yeah, out dude. to the surface a bit. I mean, that's why we're so into independent under or like independent 100%. cinema underground horrors because they can do that stuff, not give a fuck, release it on their own website. That, mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't have and to sit here to be like, oh, we need another Terrifier two in theaters. They did it. We can't. Do it. It's like yeah, and it, people don't care anymore if they're getting DVDs as long as there's like love behind it. Right. You know, if given a bigger budget, would you remake Human Hibachi? Hundred percent. There's things like when you write. Uh, these things you know you're, you already got in your mind like my budget's 10 grand or eight grand or whatever it is so you're you're limited to what you can do you know what i mean right off the bat like like i want to i want to take somebody's head and smash it and i wish i could but 
you know, you got to have the budget to do that. So um, say I knew I had $250,000, which is still nothing in the film business. But if I had 250 grand to make a movie, my script evolves, then I can do different things. Then I could make different effects that, you know, I can't do when you're limited. So 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which I thought would be kind of cool, especially if you're going to already do a prequel to it, it might be kind of a cool segue to do a, like a right. remake of the first exactly. human hibachi because you're already kind of backing, going back exactly. up a little bit. So it'd be a yeah. good opportunity. So I was throwing the idea around of like um director's cut of the first one with uh, that, this prequel thing I'm filming. And then like, just like doing some different things with the first one releasing, re-releasing as a director's cut with the added scene. So I'm still throwing that around if I want to do that or make it an actual standalone prequel. So I'm still kind of, you know, juggling that. It's, it's literally, we got some shit. So I have a uh, friend that has a Marine, I think he's in the army, but he's stationed over in Japan. So he got us some like authentic shots from Japan that are going to be in it. So it's, it's going to look cool because it's going to open up and just say like Osaka, Japan. That's going to cut to like the footage and that's going to introduce you to Jin. And then it's going to have like the bamboo torture scene. It's going to be cool. So it's going to have that authenticity. It's, yeah, uh, it'll have like really the actual cool. shots from there. And then I can film my stuff here. So, yeah, I hope it'll look cool. You never know until you actually do it. The, the scene yeah. looks soft. Yeah, it just somehow it just doesn't match. And you're like, you're like eh. yeah, you just don't know. Yeah. As someone who also films short films on my phone and all that, I can tell you it 99% of the time looks way better in my head than it ever comes out. 100%, dude. I got it in my head, but then when you do it, it's like, ah. Like, ah, that didn't go according to play. <laughs> exactly. So how many festivals have you submitted to? The first one I submitted to, uh, so the New Jersey Horror Con, I live in New Jersey. So that's a big event in Atlantic City. That's twice a year. So I submitted the first one to that. That one best feature film, it beat out five other films that were nominated. I mean, there was a bunch submitted, but then they have like four or five nominations. That yeah. one best feature, which was freaking cool. Um, they give you like these these kick-ass trophies. They're like the state of New Jersey with a skeleton and, or a skull and it's bleeding. <laughs> it looks really neat. And then the second one, I that one as well. So I, they both won back to back. I submitted both of them to Troma Dance, which is up in New York City. I'll know June 1st if that gets... I'm sure it'll get accepted because they're with trauma. Philadelphia Independent Film Festival, they both got accepted to. That's about it. There's one in Italy I'm waiting to hear back from. Um, but I haven't really done a lot with that. I haven't really been a big festival guy. Well, that's cool. I mean, it's cool. Like, the, it had a good response on, on the yeah. first side. I'm sure, like, if you bring out another big movie, you'll want to yeah, yeah, see what yeah, happens. Definitely. So Yeah, for sure. The best picture must have been awesome. Yeah, it was really neat because, again, uh, you're going against, I mean, there's films submitted all over from, you know, L.A. to France. There's one from France and all that. So, yeah, it's definitely cool. And I think it's more so the concept that won, you know, because the other films are, like, shot beautifully. And, you know, I mean, you can't really compete with their technology. But I think it was more so the concept that was different that kind of caught on to what they liked yeah like would you say that like this was one of the more silly films compared to like the other ones which were way more oh, 100%, yeah because i mean around the time that this came out you know with covid and everything <clears throat> it was probably you know people getting ready to go into lockdown and all that it was probably yep. people like we want that silly goofy you know exactly. everything's so serious right now we don't you know yeah so you, you nailed it man. grab that when you got it you kind of grabbed yeah. that when it was needed yeah you nailed it it's uh it was more so like they're light, like like in terms of like you said, like they're they're they have a lot of comedy, and yeah. that that's you know what I mean. I did that when I wrote the script. I was like, you know, let's make it where they're kind of like a sick comedy. So um, for sure, man. I mean, people like that. I mean, if you're if you do if you do stuff that comes off like too too serious, the film's taking itself too serious, which is not what I wanted to <laughs> come off as. A, you know, I wanted to come off like sick humor almost. Well, I liked yours too because it wasn't slapstick humor. It was more just like if you imagine. Like because right. it's found footage that people are gonna talk shit to each other, they're gonna be a little like they're gonna have banter, and that's right. like what you more created, um, other than yeah. just like a like Haha, this yeah. happened, you know, it's not like a slap, it's like oops, I dropped the head, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's not like that's stuff right. like that, you know. An added layer to that to, that I found <laughs> like kind of a sense of like absurdist humor, where right. kind of like what the fuck is going on, like what, right. like, why is it like it added that kind of extra depth to it as well. 100%. Yeah. And, and, you know, and that, that's the actors a lot because I'm big on improv. So it really like in the first hibachi, like at the, uh, the dinner scene when they're eating in the kitchen, those guys were like their chemistry together is really good. So like they never met before. I mean, they came from like, one, again, that one came from Chicago, one was from Colorado, one was from like New York area. So they all met that night, you know, we didn't rehearse or anything. I was like, listen, guys, I was like, I have a feeling your chemistry is going to be pretty good. So just run with the script and make it, you know, fucking cool basically yeah. like i was like i'll stop you if it's something out of line but i was like just run with this and just like bounce off each other and that's kind of how it played out like where they were 
buddies forever and they were just bullshitting and having fun and the coolness behind that yeah so there was like no script you literally just kind of sat them down you're like here's point a here's point b that's right just- yeah, exactly and i'll stop it and it's so hard when you're filming iphone like found footage style because uh you know when you're doing like a cinematic film you could you could cut it and say listen we'll get it from a different angle that's all right you that you mess that line up we'll just take it from a different angle when yeah. you're doing it like a one take one You'll take know this when it goes from like here to here yeah that's- yeah dude and you gotta <laughs> run the whole scene because there's no way to cut around it so you gotta kind of like keep it going and hope they just keep flowing so, so did you use any form of like tripods or steady cams with your iphone or was it all freehand no so uh the first one was all freehand the second one i that's something i did different now i bought i went on amazon and i bought like one of those things you can hold that the mm-hmm. iphone can plan in which actually gives it more like a steady feel, like a steady cam. Where you do um, a mic thing on the top. It had a mic on there. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's like an attachment. I love that. Like the first time it cut, I saw like the big mic on top of the camera. I was like, that's great. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I did that for the second one. And I believe we had a, a like a tripod too. So, yeah, it was a little more, I don't want to say tech driven but it was more tech driven than the first one for sure but so outside of the human hibachi series is there any other types of horror films or any other ideas of movies you want to make oh yeah uh i have something pretty crazy i i uh i thought of it about a year ago because i think i'm gonna just cut it at this i don't think i'm gonna do a third one i'm just stopping i'm I'm gonna do something with that prequel just because it's like a short um but i have an idea that it's pretty wild. I can't really get into it, but it's it's definitely like a cult, real trauma feel to it. But it's nice. something I don't think it's been done before. I'm definitely digging it. It's a it's a spoof title off the Blair Witch Project, but it's completely out. And it's it's just crazy. So it's called the Hairy Bitch Project. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <man. clears throat> nice. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's great. Like the Bear Witch Project. Have you ever heard of those? Yeah, they're not, yeah, not the like Blair Witch, but they're the Bear Witch. There's right. like the, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, if it is not a Bigfoot movie, then I just got my hopes. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but, man, you'll see. You're, you're, yeah. It's it's fucking nuts. So. so are you planning on doing any merch for any of your releases or kind of expanding beyond just DVDs and streaming? Yeah, so the first one, I mean, my wife makes t-shirts. We've sold, we sold some t-shirts and all that. I don't really push it as much as I should. Uh, I'm a winemaker, believe it or not. Yeah, uh, I read about that. I yeah, yeah, I'm a winemaker. That. that sounds yeah, cool. Yeah, my, dad, uh, my dad's been doing it for about 23 years now. So I actually am thinking about just doing like a uh, like a hibachi red, because I, I love red wine. So yeah. I'm going to get labels and make like a hibachi red, blood red wine. So I'm going to, yeah. I, I might not. I think that's a great right? idea. Personally. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to make some cool labels, Hibachi Red, you know, straight from the director that actually made the wine. You yeah. should do a uh, one and two and then get a bottle a bottle of wine that's included and do it as like so a cool, bundle. Man. Yeah, that would yeah. be dope as hell, actually. Cause it, cause I think it has that's a great idea. Theme. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. got the food theme and, you know, so. Yeah. And some chopsticks, uh, too, or something. We got a batch coming out, I want to say, in July. So I'm thinking about getting some, you know, decent looking labels printed out and see what i could do with that do like maybe like a tied in release with the prequel or something exactly maybe like a box set with like the wine yeah. model be so cool. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or, or make a blu-ray that has all of them yeah that's smart yeah, yeah. Or like even blu-ray a double blu-ray, blu-ray of like the mm-hmm. director's cut hibachi bottle of wine and yeah. Hibachi too. Yeah, it's, i don't know yeah, there's, so do. there's so much you can do there's so much you can do with yeah. all of them. you know what's funny is like and then I, like some people like some some of the people that like the film want want me to do a third and i'm just like man i don't feel like it's not it, here's the thing i feel like if you don't nail the fucking the films after the first, if you don't nail them, it can ruin the whole franchise. I don't want to do that. Yeah. You know I think what you would have to do is you would have to make a couple of movies, get your name renown, and then make right. an entire remake that basically is just a retelling of the whole story as a whole. Exactly, yeah. And, and then it's not a sequel. It's not anything. It's just a, I'm doing it now with more money and, and yeah, more exactly. ideas. Yeah, kind of like, like a remake. You don't want to do it right away because then it kind of looks pushed and forced. Mm-hmm. Human Hibachi yeah. in the hood. For sure. <laughs> Coming to Amityville series. <laughs> All good. Amityville Hibachi girl. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> in making these films, have you met any uh, icons or bigger people in the industry? Like what are your Lloyd big Kaufman. people? Lloyd yeah. Kaufman. So yeah. he, uh, the owner of Troma, obviously you know who he is. He, mm-hmm. um, He's a big fan of this, you know, the hibachi stuff. So he, um, I met him a couple times just, uh, you know, at the events and all, but he's, he's iconic to me just because of, you know, what he's done. He's a big fan. Other film, like the earlier films I did. Yeah. Like, you know, Jessica Cameron is our mm-hmm. actress. She that does more me. 
yeah carmen electra i met her oh nice she, That's that was cool. really cool yeah yeah i met her yep um different people but yeah not do too you much. Know, do you go to a lot of like horror cons or i don't i, I mean i now that i got now that i had my film in them like in these festivals and all i started going but before i never did now nah. wasn't into it so there's two dvd stores in tennessee that uh bought like six of the dvds each uh you know grindhouse video yeah mm -hmm. grindhouse. yeah so they picked it up uh they they sold out in like a week which is cool um and this other place called Southland Dungeon. They're only like a half hour away from each other. So Southland Dungeon uh, is going to have like a, uh, they're going to, in when I go down there in like July, they're going to have a signing and a, uh, they're going to screen the films for like, they have like a actual screening room. So that I'm starting to branch out and do stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like where, you know, I travel to like maybe like a store that holds it and we'll do a signing, stuff like that. So yeah. it's pretty cool. So what can we expect in the coming future? And is there any shout outs you want to give before we go? Yeah, so um, for sure, this this prequel that I'm doing, that's the most immediate future I'm doing is this uh, this prequel. I'm shooting it in uh, three weeks. Uh, probably I'm going to have that wrapped up by July 1st. I don't know how I, how I'm going to release it exactly, but, you know, my Instagram page, Human Hibachi, I believe it's at Human Hibachi. I, I'm pretty frequent on there with posting and updating. So if you follow that, um, you can pretty much see what's going on with that particular franchise online or on Facebook. Mario Cerrito, you can follow me on there. That's where I kind of do all the other stuff. So, but yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at right now. Nice. Just taking it easy, man. Family and I got three kids, man. So I'm, my my life's nuff. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. three kids, my wife, house. Good though, man. Seems seems like it's going good though. Man. Yeah, it's going good, man. All right. Well, thanks for giving you your time and uh, thanks for having me, man. appreciate it. Yeah, it's super cool, man. Um, I appreciate you guys supporting independent film for real. Yeah, no, for sure. Keep keep it up. Yeah, man. Thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Take care, man. We'll see All you. All right, man. Later. All right, bye.